so we can go ahead and start. Um, Jonathan, do you want to lead us today? Sounds like good. Absolutely. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we have a great session planned, um, several individuals to share their stories, um, strength, hope, um, and recovery uh, from problem gaming behavior, all veterans. Um, if you're new to this meeting, this is the uh, Northeast Veteran Problem Gambling and Suicide Prevention Coalition. We are blessed to have you. Um, our main objective is to raise awareness um, of the issue of problem gambling behavior among veterans and ensure that the resources are available for them. Our mission is to build awareness of problem gambling within the veteran community as it relates to suicide risk. Um, you can read through our goals there. We have five of them. Um, the coalition that we developed covers four counties within the Albany region. That's Albany, Schenectady, Rensselaer, and Saratoga counties. Um, we hope to identify service members, veterans, and their families um, and screen for suicide risk and problem gambling um, by promoting connectedness to resources and improve care uh, transitions. Also, we increase education regarding lethal means safety and, and safety planning through various presentations and outreach measures that we do. Um, and we also hope to increase protective factors and reduce risk factors for problem gambling and suicide. Um, if you're not aware, um, problem gambling behavior is um, one behavior that has an increased risk for the veteran and military service population. Um, most of us should know that the military um, connected population is at a higher risk for suicide. Now, gambling addiction does have the highest suicide rate out of any addiction. So when you put the two together, um, frankly, it's an issue um, too big not to address. Um, today, we will be um, hosting a panel, um, hopefully with three individuals. Um, so far, we have David and Nathan. Um, I'd like to introduce David and, and Dr. Waite, if you'd like to introduce Nathan. Um, uh, Dave Yeager, uh, personal friend of mine. He's one that, frankly, when I started my position as the Veteran Outreach Coordinator, um, took me under his wing and showed me the ways. Um, he's been in this, this field for quite some time, um, sustained recovery. He's a huge advocate of getting services to veterans and active duty service members. Um, he is also the host of the uh, Fall In, the Problem Gambling Podcast for Military Service Members and Veterans. Um, I'll put his link in the chat box. So if you haven't checked out his podcast, please do so. Um, Dr. Reed, if you'd like to introduce Nathan. Absolutely. Uh, Nathan is a, um, a very significant contributor and a longtime contributor to our uh, the gambling support group that Maureen Corbett runs at the Albany Stratton VA Medical Center once a week. He's a, a fantastic resource. He's been with the program and in treatment with us for quite some time. And he's been a very influential contributor to that group, especially when <clears throat> people newer to recovery come into that group. He is one of the folks who kind of steps up and really takes them. <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm recovering from something. Um, he takes them under their wing, under his wing, and uh, kind of really kind of guides them through the recovery process. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm very happy that he's here today. He's always very positive and bubbly, as, you, as you've already seen. He's got a great sense of humor. And he's just a really positive influence on the group in general. And I'm looking forward to having him share his story with us. All right, uh, if, if we'd like to get started, um, does anybody wanna lead the, the discussion or have any um, questions that they'd like to start off with for our, for our panelists? I've developed some prompt questions that we can ask, um, but if you'd like, I think just to get the ball rolling. So basically what the expectation is here, Dave and Nathan, just to share your stories, your lived experience in recovery. Um, and give, an ins give us insight, give the people in attendance here, the community partners who are in the treatment community, an insight into what your personal experience has been, both with gambling and in recovery, um, positives and negatives. Um, and basically, just to get the ball rolling, my first question would probably be, when did you start realizing that gambling was an issue for you? And what did that look like? How did you know that it was a problem? And I, I don't know if you want to do an open discussion forum if we want to, or if we want to select people to respond. David, would you like to go first? Sure, no problem at all. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, it it manifested itself um, actually while I was on active duty in 2001. It was about a month, month and a half after the events of 9/11. I was on orders to Korea and went there on a tour by myself, uh, left family at home, um, 
got there was extremely stressed because I had already been arguing and fighting with my my then first wife at the time. I was leaving my two young kids behind. I was stepping into God knows what, you know, because at the time, of course, President Bush was calling that the axis of evil. So, you know, who knew what you were stepping into, got over there, um, got on the ground, you're 12 hours separated. So now I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'm irritated, I have anxiety. They put me up in uh, the Dragon Hill Lodge, which by the way, if you've ever been to Korea is a fantastic place to stay. Um, but that aside, they put me up in there. So I was walking around tired, but couldn't sleep. Uh, finally got something to eat and I'm walking around and lo and behold, I see a casino style slot room right there in the hotel. So I decided, okay, let me kill some time. I can't sleep right now anyway. And I got in there and I was playing for a while. And lo and behold, um, you know, I made what I consider one of the biggest mistakes a budding compulsive gambler can make. And I, I won. Um, and I'm hardly going to say that I broke the bank in that day, but I won. And what I can remember from that moment is that all of that stress, all of that anxiety, all of that feeling temporarily just stopped. Um, all of a sudden I felt good in that moment. And while I'm not gonna say that that was the magical switch that got flipped, what I will say is I can go back and refer to that back as when that feeling started to happen that I wanted to recreate. When that feeling of, I don't have to deal with stuff because I can sit in front of this machine and it'll magically take me away, kind of began. And over the course of that year is when it developed. So if I were to pick a starting point that I would honestly pick that, and I do refer to that often when I talk about this, is that was kind of the starting point for me. And thank you for that, Dave. And, you know, your story just showcases the, the one thing that people, most people in the treatment community already know, that it starts with that big win and that rush. And we chase that rush from then on, don't we? So I, I'm uh, yours is yours. That's a great story. And it, the, how you were introduced to gambling is not uncommon, especially in the military overseas on military bases and the slot machines, as we all know as well. Nathan, what about you? You want to share how when you first started to realize you were developing an issue? You have to unmute yourself, Nathan. Uh, I keep hitting the button and it keeps popping back up to unmute. That's because Dr. Waite was trying to unmute you at the same time and muting you by accident. Oh. Please continue, Nathan. Okay. Back in 83, when I was in the Navy, we made a couple of West Packs on, on the West Coast and Every port we hit was a military base because I was on a Gator freighter and all we did was transport Marines. So every base had a base club and there was the slot machine room. And I became addicted to those slot machines and it eventually got me kicked out of the Navy with a general honorable discharge because I basically turned myself in. No, but the, nobody wanted to do anything for treatment. So, and I was very suicidal back then and I wanted to end my life. And so that I was a ship serviceman. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but we had the ship store, laundry, barbershop, vending machines and a dollar bill changer that was in DC Central. And I was an E5 at the time and I had the key to the dispersing office and a combination to a safe and I was in charge of a change fund. The two do not go together. So needless to say, I helped myself the money from the safe and from the dollar bill changer because I was responsible for keeping that filled. And eventually I got kicked out of the service. But when I, after being kicked out of the service, you know, I wasn't really, had a good paying job and I sort of slipped away from gambling. It got me kicked out, but 
it didn't pick up again until after I was here on my own in Albany County living up at Valley View and things came to a head back in 2015 when my gambling caused me to be evicted from my apartment and I ended up at the vet house over in Arbor Hill and going through the VA to get services, you know, Carrie Blanchard and Maureen Corbett. And they, she referred me to the Center for Problem Gambling over on Warren Street. So I went to meetings over there. And since then they've changed their format where now you gotta have a counselor and pay a copay to see somebody over there. So the only thing I have now is Maureen Corbett with the center, with the gambling group on Monday mornings. And December 19th, I'll be queen five years. Yes, it's a quite an accomplishment. Nate, that is a wonderful accomplishment. I'm, I'm really, I love, I, I appreciate you sharing your stories, your story with us. And I, I really love um, your genuineness. I'm concerned that to hear you say that there was no treatment available at the time. That, that's very disturbing, which is what this, one of the things this coalition is trying to address. We're trying to increase awareness of gambling disorder and also increase treatment services in the community here in New York. So thank you for your story. Mike Purcell has joined us. Hi, Mike. Can you hear us? Mike? Maybe you have him muted still and you gotta uh, mute me. He's not muted. So. Mike, can you hear us? I see a finger. All right. Well, hopefully he can hear us. I don't know if, if we can't hear him. Mike, wave if you can hear me. He can't hear me. All right. <laughs> so we'll move on to the, the next question I'm curious about. What certainly gambling disorder affects our lives in so many different areas. And I'm wondering what was the most significant impact gambling has had on your life? I think you've already, both of you have already kind of indicated um, an answer to this question, but there might be other answers as well. With Nate uh, getting discharged from the military, for example, that was a consequence. What, how do you think gambling has affected you or your loved ones most? Well, I was mostly single at the time, you know, I didn't have no significant other. And like I said, I wasn't really ready to get out of the service, you know, but I violated a trust and that's the reason they used and And like I said, they didn't offer any treatment. You know, they were more concerned about my suicidal tendencies. So after I was back in port and they were going through the process of having me administratively discharged, and whenever the ship set sail, they sent me TAD to the base because uh, they was afraid I was gonna hmm. jump ship and end my life. You know, and I had to meet with a drag lawyer in the Long Beach Naval Base, you know, and to discuss my case. And and he came up with the offer, you know, to waive the board, you know, for administrative discharge, you know, for by accepting a general honor, honorable condition, so I won't lose any benefits by that type of discharge. And we signed on to it and we went from there. And December 2nd of 85 was the date I was discharged. And that's a very significant date because that my, was my mother's birthday. <laughs> So it's probably a date you're and, gonna remember, I would think. I would think. Yeah. 
Yeah. And a significant event happened that Monday evening because it was a Monday and there was a Chicago Bears Miami Dolphins football game on that evening. And it was the Bears Super Bowl season and it turned out to be the Bears only loss of the season to the Dolphins. I see. You know, what, what a way to remember a date, huh? Right. Dave, what about you? What do you think the most significant impact gambling has had on your life is? Dude, <laughs> I can give you a, a whole list, uh, but let's start with let's start with family. Um, my gambling created a divorce. My gambling lost me contact with my children for two years. Um, my gambling alienated me from my own family. I alienated myself from my own family. Um, it also got me a general under honorable discharge from the military because I stole twice from my own unit um, mm. in order to fund my gambling. It, you know, there were there are so many things that I can go into that this created in my life as far as, you know, just, <laughs> just, just chaos. I mean, my life was essentially chaos for many, many years because my drive to gamble was so intense. I quit, I quit three jobs because they were interfering with my time to gamble. Um, I stole from an employer because of my desire to gamble. And then, you know, much like Nathan was just discussing, every time that I did that, I admitted to it because the shame and the guilt around what I had done was so bad that because it's not me, that's not my personality, that's not who I am, yet I was so driven to go do this, I was so driven to go gamble, that I stole from an employer that was rapid firing me through the ranks in terms of training and bringing me to what would have been a very, very good career, you know, and I basically just, you know, stomped on their face and said, you know, what the heck with you, I'm going to take your money. So, you know, you talk about impact. I just, I, I look back now and I, you know, now being in recovery for a while, I, I look back on that and I just go, how, how in the world could I have done that? But yet I think about when I was in the throes of my addiction, I know exactly how I could have done it. I was so driven to, to, to feed my addiction. I was so driven to gamble that everything around me, to be honest with you, didn't matter. And even though it mattered deep down, even though in the back of my mind it mattered, and there was always guilt and there was always shame, and it created that cycle where I would, you know, I'd go out and I'd gamble and I'd feed the addiction and feed it and feed it. And then the crash cycle would happen afterwards where, you know, I lost all my money. So now I'm feeling really guilty. But now I'm also feeling extremely guilty because I just lied to this person. I just manipulated that person. I just took money from this person. And all of that shame and guilt built up, which then I wanted to escape and get away from. So what do I do? I go borrow more money and go right back out and gamble again to quote unquote, try to make it go away. What I lost was myself. That's what I lost. That's a good observation and, and great self-awareness on your part too. And there's a commonality with both of your stories that I think is, I don't, Dave, I don't know you very well. I know Nathan well, um, that it doesn't sound like the behavior that you both are describing would be characteristic of your personality if you weren't gambling. Is that not that at all? Obvious. Not at yeah. all. Um, I look at, you know, who I am as a person now and who I was as a person before I was in the throes of my gambling. There, there's no comparison of the two people. Um, for myself, I consider myself compassionate. I consider myself passionate. I consider myself caring. I consider myself considerate of other people's and people and how they feel and what they do. Um, I value a strong connection to my family and always did. But never, when I was in my addiction, didn't live by those values, I can tell you that. Sure. Both of you have identified issues with gaining access to treatment while you were in the military. How did you first engage in treatment? What actually got you into treatment? And Dave? <laughs> For a long time after I got out of the military, and this is something I always talk about when I tell my story, is when I was in the military, when, when Nathan, when you mentioned this, boy, did it strike a chord with me. I literally had a colonel a leader of my unit look at me and say, I don't know what to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, on a Navy base at the time. You know, look at me and talk to me about alcohol. No, so it, it wasn't addressed. Nobody knew how to talk about it. Nobody knew what to say. So, 
here I am, I get let out. Now, kindly, I'll say this, I was let out very kindly because other than what was going on with the gambling, you talk about Jekyll and Hyde, I can remember uh, a non-commissioned officer's evaluation report I had where everything on my report was top marks with the exception of character. And that was because of the gambling and the theft that I had done. Mm -hmm. Everything else was top marks. So everything was Jekyll and Hyde. So now I get out, I'm in the world. There are, I'm looking around when I realized that I had hit the depths of my addiction and I knew I had to have help. I'm looking around online to try and find an inpatient because I needed to stop and and go into the VA and the VA I can remember sitting in the VA and there was a counselor sitting there with me talking to me about behavior and drawing circles on a piece of paper which I understand a lot better now but at the time did nothing to address what I needed to hear which is you have a problem with gambling and here's what we're going to do about it until finally one counselor with the VA found this packet of information she goes you know I've had this sitting around for a while and 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 this might be helpful it turns out right on the front cover, it says gambling treatment program, Brexville, Ohio. Now, this is back when the treatment program was in Brexville, not Cleveland, hands it to me and says, here, look into this. So I looked into it. I read into it. I did all the work. I made the phone calls myself. I had the pre-screening set up. And, and lo and behold, you know, in, in June of 2007, which is when all of this first started to happen, I finally got myself into treatment and stepped in the door. And within an hour said, finally, somebody gets it. Finally, somebody understands what's going on with me because I don't, I don't. So uh, I guess that was kind of the flow of the process of feeling lost um, until I finally found a direction. And I'm just going to add this in. The sad part is you can still go to a lot of clinicians within the VA system and they have no idea the gambling treatment program exists. Unfortunately, that's very true to this day, but that's something that the, we are working on. Um, there, We've opened up a second residential treatment program in the VA healthcare system. After 42 years, there's now two. So that's wonderful. Nathan, what about you? How did you first engage in treatment? I think you're muted again, and I didn't do it this time. You have to unmute yourself, Nathan. Oh, there it is. Okay. There, you go. there you go. Yes. They were more concerned with my risk of suicide in the Navy than uh, even bringing up the gambling problem. So when you eventually and, did go into treatment for gambling, how did that, what did that look like? Okay, well, after I got discharged and I moved back here to the upstate New York area, to Skyro, where I went to school um, and I was working and I had regular medical insurance. You know, I was being treated with a clinician for my depression. And then it wasn't until after I got into the VA that I started seeing a psychiatrist and getting prescribed antidepressants, which I'm on to now. Mm -hmm. And then the treatment for the gambling did not start until 2015 after I was evicted in February of that year from Valley View Apartments up in Waterville. So my gambling, you know, I failed to pay the rent. You know, I'd sit in a store in Stewart's or someplace and I even had one store owner let me have scratch offs on credit. I could pay them on payday. And of course, after I got evicted, I haven't been back to that store. And I think to this day, I still owe that guy 300 bucks for scratch offs he let me have without paying for him. And then I seen Maureen and she got me the referral for the Center for Problem Gambling and I started going there and then she came out the gambling group at the VA. And you now I sort of left the one and 
everything didn't get resolved until after I won my social security disability appeal and got the big settlement and they required me to have a representative payee to handle my funds. So they got my lump sum settlement check to went to adult protective services to their trust fund. And they've been getting my monthly social security check since then, in 2015. See. And the, the vet house up there in Arbor Hill helped me get in the South Mall Towers here on South Pearl Street. And I love this location. I got a fantastic apartment and I got over 68 by 10 photos up on the wall around my apartment to, for they could create a relaxing atmosphere. And then I rebuilt my DVD collection, my CDs with my money from my settlement. So, you know, I can show you my collection, I don't know if you can see that. Those are my Blu-rays and CDs on my counter. Can you see that? Absolutely, Nathan. And that speaks to the things that you're able to do now that you, you're not spending money on gambling, right? You're right. Yeah. And December 19th will be my five year anniversary of being clean. That's fantastic. And Gentlemen, I have all I have you gotta do is look around and see all the eight by ten photos I got posted, suns rises, sunsets, scenic views. It's a much better hobby than being at the casino, wouldn't you say? Yeah, instead of buying scratch offs all the time. Yeah. There's and I, have... I like to joke with Maureen that it, when she brings up an, our individual sessions about gambling, I just make the comment, please don't swear. <laughs> That's a bad word, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I get it. She gets a, she gets a chuckle out of it every time. I'll bet. Well, gentlemen, there's one other question I'd like to ask both of you, and then maybe we open it up to the other participants here on the call. Maybe they can open the floor for questions they can ask you. So. There, are, when it comes to gambling treatment, there are very many sources. Um, community support, like gambling disorder, uh, Gamblers Anonymous, um, groups that we've talked about, individual therapy we've talked about. What has, what do you think has worked best for you when it came? Once you finally entered treatment, what really gave you traction in your own recovery? Is it any one thing or a combination of things? I think it was a combination of things because I went to the Center for Problem Gambling, you know, when they were fully funded and didn't have to worry about copay mm -hmm. or pay anything. And then I got in with Maureen and the gambling group at the VA and individual sessions with her. But then the pandemic hit mm. and they went to Zoom meetings on the Center for Problem Gambling, and I always had problems with them, stupid things on my cell phone signing in, and I just said to hell with them. Yeah. You know, and then the only thing I was doing was participating with the Maureen and the Monday morning gambling groups. And since then, I haven't been back to the center, but now they have drop in meetings available couple of days a week where anybody can join in just by going into the center. But since I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease over a year ago, I'm afraid to go out in public a lot because I uh, don't want to have an accident in public. Mm, okay. And I got to go into the VA every eight weeks for an IV. And I just had my IV yesterday for, for the eight week period. And it took over just over three hours for that IV to be administered. Wow. And I'm not even sure the medication I'm on is doing its job. So they drew lab work and three tubes of blood to send out to see if they got up my medication level or changed me over to something else. Okay. And it's very frustrating. It sounds like it is. 
Dave, so, what about you? What, what do you feel is the, uh, what, what, what in treatment and gambling treatment has worked best for you? What necessarily hasn't worked best for you? It, it, what it all boils down to, and, and there's actually two phases of my learning process for my addiction. When I went into gambling treatment back in 2007, I knew I had a gambling problem. They identified the gambling problem. I really felt like I was getting a grip on it. Um, and for a while I had some clean time and I was doing really well, but I made a big mistake and it was a huge learning point for me because what I did was eventually I, I thought in my mind, the three worst words I could ever think to myself, which is I got this, um, yeah. don't need these meetings anymore. I'm doing okay. I'm not thinking about gambling. I feel great. You know, got back out into the world, met the met or reconnected with the woman who's now my wife. Meanwhile, the whole time, the addiction was slowly creeping back in because I was not doing the one thing that today I know I need to do, which is staying connected to my recovery. Um, you know, the one thing I've learned is that when I'm among people whose desires are similar to mine, whose focus is similar to mine, whose energy is similar to mine, that's when I succeed. Um you know, even sitting here right now, you know, with a couple of people who've been through this, but with a group of people who genuinely want to provide and do things for people like me, there's an energy that comes from that that keeps me secured in my recovery. Being able to tell my story keeps me secured in my recovery. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the thing that I used to think the first time around was so cliche was living it a day at a time. You know, I think, ah, yeah, okay, day at a time. No, you know what? I live this recovery today. That's when I worry about my recovery. Um, and the way I do it now is primarily I do have once a week, I have a uh, in-person GA meeting I go to, which I very much like that meeting. It's very supportive to me. It's very helpful to me. I have online gambling, uh, a gambling support group online, which is available every single day of the week to me if I should want to do that. And it's actually run by a very close friend of mine and, and is international. There's people from around the world. The cool thing about that group is when you get on there, you can feel the energy among people who want to be in recovery. You know, that to me is strip away the individual methods of doing it, you know, whether it's smart recovery, whether it's recovery dharma, whether it's 12 step, whether it's counseling, whatever it happens to be, all of those things work for me if there's a sense of connection to the recovery. If I don't feel that sense of connection, if I walk into a GA room and the GA room is more about the rules and regulations than it is about the recovery in the room, then I just gently excuse myself and I move on to the next room. You know, I, I, there's no grudge. Hey, you do it. You do you. But for me, what I need for my recovery is to feel connected to the other people in that room. So if, if I were to cite one thing, no matter what the method is, that to me is the bottom line goal. That's a wonderful observation. And, and you're absolutely right. In recovery in general, not just for gambling, connection to other people is crucial. We, if, if people could recover from their gambling disorder on their own, we'd all be out of a job for one thing and we wouldn't be here, right? So we need other people. We, we have to have other people and we have to have accountability to ourselves and to other people in the recovery community and in the treatment community um, in order to be successful or it leads to success, put it that way. I think, um, and Robin just re reiterated that in the chat box. I think that uh, I don't have any further questions. I'm wondering if anybody else on the call has any questions they'd like to ask David or Nathan. Well, I'm always wondering, and of course, this is coming from someone who answers the helpline to get people connected to care. Um, and he's, and, uh, you know, Dave, I feel like I've asked you this before, and I know that people need to be ready to receive help. They need to be there. But just any words of wisdom for people that answer the help calls, like things that we can say to maybe motivate someone a little more towards that stage of change and active listening for sure. I, I always want to make sure they're heard. I think that's important, but yeah, I, I, I think it starts with, I think it starts with, if I'm being honest, what do you need? Um, I think that starts and then listening to the response very closely, you know, obviously that active listening is a huge part of it. Um, but if I'm making that call, I want someone to hear what I'm saying to them, you know, maybe use a little bit of clarification just to make sure you've got the message. And, and 
yeah, somebody may not be ready. I may be that caller who's calling in because I ran out of money and I'm trying to figure out how to get money. So I'm calling you to see if there's a source to it. But you might say that one word when you're listening to me and you might hear that one thing I say to you where then you can respond and say, you know what, here's what I'm hearing. Here's what I'm hearing that you're struggling with. And I'm wondering if maybe we can direct you to somebody just to have a little bit more of a conversation with it. I think there's a delicacy, especially at the beginning of recovery, because there's so much rawness and somebody's sitting on that fence right in between, I want to go back to it and I need help, you know, and the pull of I want to go back to it, you know, the hook side of it is so strong that you can't reach in with the proverbial cane and pull somebody off the stage like that. You know, it's listening to what they're saying and then finding that inward. And that's not always easy, I'm imagining. But at the same time, I think it's critical because there's still that strong pull to want to stay in the addiction, even though the guilt's bad, the shame's bad, the, you know, I feel like I'm at rock bottom is bad. That pull of the addiction is still there. Total makes total sense. And the good news is, Dave, I think I'm, I think I'm doing an okay job then when I'm answering this phone line. And I just wanted to make one comment. I mean, it's so amazing to me that like Les, I heard you say that, you know, it's the second treatment program in 40 something years, but it's kind of like we've gone from very limited to resources to in the last five years alone, just increasing them to the point where sometimes I'm afraid I'm overwhelming the callers when they call in with almost too many options, because again, it's not a one size fits all so many different doors to get there, different pathways. So I just always want to make sure they know, because especially when it comes to the peer community connecting with folks like yourself and Nathan, it's just so important to hear other people's stories. And that's a lot of the times people do kind of want to start there. So anyway, hopefully I'm not overwhelming them. I'm happy we have more options. I appreciate yeah. you both being here. I'm going to throw one more thing in there, Robin, if I can, and just, you know, refer them to because you'd be surprised how many people their guard comes down when they get onto Reddit or they get into some of these podcasts and they're able to hear other people talk about it and they can sit there and go, hey, that guy's like me. Hey, mm -hmm. how I remember my very first GA meeting I went into was at the Brexville VA Center when I was in my first treatment there. And they made me go to a, a GA meeting and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm not going to this cult meeting. And I sat down and I heard somebody start to talk and I'm like, how in the world does this person know about me? And then the second person got up and they started talking. I'm like, wait, how does this person know about me? And it immediately started to break down those barriers. So, And now we have online resources where somebody can anonymously go on there, play this thing, listen to somebody's story and go, holy mackerel, I'm not alone. You know, and that alone could begin to break down that barrier. Yeah, can I say that coming out of, well, we're not out of the pandemic, but heading into the pandemic, the fact that so many more virtual meetings came around. So things like Gamblers and Recovery and, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the other one, Recovery Road Online, things like that that have really come about and have like this strong foothold in the community now, recovery community, I think is so important. Um, the podcasts, I mean, Dave, I listen to the podcast almost daily while I go for walks, and I'm telling you, it helps me with everything that I do. So it's such an important resource just as someone assisting others um, to get to learn way more about, uh, you know, gambling problems and kind of the better things to say when trying to help someone. So I appreciate those. Share them all the time. People are very receptive to them. So I agree. It's kind of like you have a friend along with you, you know, if you're afraid to go into a room with other people. So I just want to take a second to say thank you to the both of you for taking time for sharing your, ex your experiences with us. I'm as a provider, I'm a social worker and I work with veterans and honestly to just take a step back and hear your story. It also makes me feel as a provider where I've been lacking. Um, it hasn't been really until I met um, these wonderful folks on, on the screen where gambling really became part of my interventions with individuals. Um, and I think that as a provider, I was lacking that, um, you know, and that kind of goes to my question to the both of you, um, you know, both of you shared that when gambling became a problem for you all, it sounded like you had to really search for services or there weren't any at all, you know, at this moment, as you know, Robin shared, there, there are resources out there, but how can we as providers, peers, how can we make it known or just 
you know, I think kind of it's along the same lines, Robin, as the question you were asking, but like, how do we make it known to individuals that support is there? Or, you know, if you could go back to when you were seeking those services, what would you have, like, what would you have wished was there? You know, how can we help those that are either starting their recovery or coming back to it, you know, and need that additional support? What can we as providers do for you all, um, you know, for those starting, you know, where do we begin? Um, because as I said, I can speak for myself. I felt that I've learned so much and I'm still learning. So I thank you again for sharing that with us. Um, but I'm, I would be curious as to what advice you have for us. I'll, I'll say this, and I'm only going to go back to my own experience. If, if the VA were to educate all of its clinicians on just the availability of gambling treatment and, and you know, the increase in, you know, gambling addiction and, and gambling disorder throughout the country, if all you did was, was do that and provide a a 10 slide deck throughout the VA to all providers throughout the VA, just to raise awareness among you guys, right? That could make the biggest difference in the world because then I walk in there and when I'm sitting in front of you, I don't see a deer in the headlights. What I see is somebody who writes, oh yeah, we just trained about this. You know what? There's a program available to you. Let me give you a resource. Oh, or, oh, in this VA center, we have a person who does an outpatient you know, resource for veterans. Let me refer you to this. Or, oh, you're in the Western part of New York here. Let me refer you to the council over here. Maybe we can get you some of the help that you need. Just to be able to say that to somebody and recognize when they're saying, I have a problem and, and you're starting to hear maybe some of the, the, the nine signs or symptoms out of the DSM-5 or whatever it is, right? Even if you're doing a, the, the brief biosocial or even if you're doing something in a screening, from a screening standpoint, get to know that person as a problem gambler and, and you let them know that you recognize that problem that much quicker, they might be willing to engage in, in the treatment. Thank you for that. And I think since we, we've started with the coalition, I think we've been trying to put forward a lot more education within our facility, but also within our community. Um, but, you know, putting some, a packet together to say, hey, this is a resource that you can keep in the back, you know, you can keep there if needed. I think that's a great, great um, recommendation that that's something that we could probably bring back and have discussions within our facility. Thank you for that. I'm curious, was there any um, like support to your loved ones and like, you know, uh, either spouses or family members who were going, you know, through this with you and, you know, experiencing, you know, the losses. And when you started to get into treatment, was there anything um, that they found useful? Like as, um, you know, just whether it be, uh, you know, a spouse, a significant other, uh, and whoever it could have been parent, child, you know, I'm just curious, like what kind of family and like um, resources are available or were available or would have even been helpful um, since they did experience a lot of the losses along with you? From, from my own experience, my last go with the VA gambling treatment program, which now is at Lewis Stokes in Cleveland, is we actually did family calls while we were inpatient. So the family was able to get on and ask questions. That's the only experience that I've had from a VA standpoint. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, if a family member can get into Gammonon, if a Gamblers Anonymous group has a Gammonon available, my wife attends Gammonon every single week. And mm -hmm. she tells me how much she's learned about this addiction and how much she you know, the impact it has on her and what she can and can't do in terms of her own role in all of this. So if the most impactful thing I would recommend right now is Gammonon, but I would say if, you, if, if the VA system, as you get more involved in gambling treatment, if you can start to do more family-focused treatment and get them to understand the addiction a little better, that would be a huge step. Dave, thank you very much. I know you have to roll. I know you're, you're, you're almost double booked. You have another training coming up at 11. Thank you so much for what you do. You're an absolute tremendous resource. Um, thank you very much. I want to give you at least a couple of minutes to, to step out and get some water. <laughs> yeah, I really do appreciate that. And I apologize. I'm up against, I have to do my day job here and go train somebody. So um, thank you all so much for allowing me to come on here and tell my story and talk about this. This is my passion. What I'm about to do is my job, which pays my bills. This is my passion that fuels my, you know, fuels what I do every day. This keeps me in recovery. So thank you guys so much for allowing me to do this. I appreciate it. 
I have one more thing I would like to add, if I could, please. Absolutely. The Center for Problem Gambling has what they call a thread on WhatsApp. It's a thing that they download on your cell phone, and you can communicate with fellow gamblers. And I put out there to that group and also to Maureen's gambling group, you know, any time of the day or night you need someone to talk to, Write my number down, give me a call, because I'm up and down like a yo-yo at night, and I offer to assist anybody who needs somebody to talk to any time of the day or night. And, you know, I don't know if Dave's in the Albany area or if he's out of the Albany area, that if he's a part of this Center for Problem Gambling thread, because I got a couple of Dave's listed on it. <laughs> but, well, Dave is out of state. By their last name. name. Yeah, Nathan. Pardon? Yeah, Nathan. Dave lives in a, a completely lives different in a state, state, but I, I like that you're oh, sharing okay. that, that app with us. That's good to know about. I, I help people and I refer people to this Center for Problem Gambling. So it's good to know about right. that Okay, because like I said, different. This is for the Omni area and I don't know how many people are on a thread from this area. And like I said, I make it a point to make myself available to receive a phone call any time of the day or night somebody needs it. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. a wonderful resource, Nathan. Thank, resource, Nathan. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Bringing that Nathan, up. Mike, if you can hear us now, I, thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate your, your, your spending the time and energy to speak with us. Your stories were wonderful, and we, we've heard your suggestions. I want you to know that, and we'll take them to heart. Absolutely. I'll send you my bill. <laughs> Keep in mind, we're nonprofit. We're nonprofit. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you, Nathan. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. you and thank well. you for everyone who joined. Today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is great to be part Yeah. One thing in closing, uh, November 15th at Syracuse University, we'll be having a conference, New York Council on Problem Gambling, we'll be having a conference uh, specifically on veteran problem gambling behavior. Um, it will be a hybrid conference, so you will be able to join virtually if you're not able to make it to Syracuse. Uh, I just want to throw that out there. I can get the link to everybody. I know Jennifer and Michelle, um, Dr. Wade, they, they all have the flyers. Um, so we hope to see everybody there. Well, thank you, everyone. You have a good day. Thank you. You too. Let me stop recording now. Thank you.